Hey everybody, I'm Jason from Soul Percussion and we are back with another hang for our Brooklyn Bound podcast and I'm very pumped. We're getting ready for our October show and one of the three or four sets on the night will be a new friend, Nina Dante, and we're very pumped to talk to her today. Hey Nina. Hello, thanks for having me. Absolutely, it felt good to say new friend. We were talking last time we, we hung on Zoom, it was like, wow, you're actually somebody that we're starting our relationship on zoom and it feels okay it's weird yes. to say yeah <laughs> every new relationship that i've made in the past six months has been with a plant fungus or animal so it's very nice to make a new human friend yeah that's good <laughs> and i'm not a yeah i love the plant and fungus being separate that was really, oh yeah um, oh yeah those babies have their own kingdom <laughs> so good so you you are near mount hood in oregon right now yes Yes, it's such a beautiful place. And we, not, we actually, yeah. Well, you're not always in that. Like if in our normal lives, pre-COVID lives, we could have met in New York. Um, exactly. But you've yeah. been chilling in, in Oregon. Yeah, my family lives here um, in the Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness near Mount Hood, about 20 minute drive or so from, from um, the last place you can start climbing up Mount Hood and park your car and stuff. Wow. And um it, it's been a very interesting two weeks, actually, because um, I'm sure you've been following the news and you've been seeing that the, there have been a lot of really heinous wildfires out here. Of course. And we have one of our own, <laughs> very, very close, called the Riverside Fire. And um, we were really lucky and it did not reach our Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness, but it did reach the wilderness area right below us. And uh, oh, we had right. to evacuate. And it's been very strange to be so directly and personally touched by climate change um especially after you know my family's been here for about a year and in that time this area has just come to mean everything to us it's so beautiful it's so rich it gives so much and it offers so many opportunities to give back so it it's it's been a very devastating couple of weeks and, Man, and galvanizing as well <laughs> I'm totally embarrassed when when we picked up the Zoom call. I didn't ask, and then when you said you've been following the news, I go, Did yeah. you like you know, are, are we talking Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Are we talking about <laughs> yeah, uh, what what Breonna Taylor? Are we talking about COVID? Are we talking like you know, beep, beep, beep. and you know, yeah. it's it's so insane. My, I mean, yeah. my I grew up in California. I think I I mentioned yes. maybe last time when we were hanging and and. You know, my sister is in the Bay Area and is definitely oh, no. you know, sending the, the, the pictures of the orange windows and um, can't go outside. Um, yes. And, and they have a, a, a terrible um, a kind of sad bit of irony where their, their street block is really wonderful. They all kind of pool together um, where, you know, <clears throat> one house takes all the water bottles, you know, that they would need in case oh. of emergency. Another takes, you know. But so one house had all the N95 masks, which of course, six months ago, they donated all the N95 masks to the local hospitals. And so now they were in this messed up position where they're like, we can't go outside. They actually had a drill in the neighborhood that they wanted to do an evacuation drill that they canceled because of air quality. And it's just, it's just these, oh you, know, you know, terrible. I, I grew up in Southern California, which had a lot of fires, but I never evacuated and, and my parents evacuated two years ago for the first time. Um, it seems like a lot of people so you, are you, evacuating got close for the enough. first time. Yeah, yeah, it got yeah. quite close. So you're to back. I, I can see with your picture, you're back. But. Yes. Thank God. Yeah. And I don't know if you can hear on the microphone, but it's raining. And um, we we had a really, really unusually dry summer, and like really just one day of rain in the whole summer. And this is the Pacific Northwest, you know, it's dry in the summer, but usually it's raining to some degree. So that just really exacerbated things. Um, but a week ago, last Thursday, actually, it's marked in my calendar forever as rain day. It rained, which really helped with the, the fires. It didn't put it out, but it really, really helped. And mm. it's been raining now steadily also for the past two days. So I'm just, I, we're in a state of elation and giddiness and the forest is looking like itself a bit more again. Mm. So, yeah. Well, I know when, when we get to talking about what you're doing on Brooklyn Bound, I feel like we're going to yeah. get to talk a little bit more about where you are and, and your 
connection to where you are, but we, we, yes. we're going to start at the beginning. Great. Nina, the first question is the broadest, you know, help, help us learn about how you got from, you know, li little, little Nina getting excited about music to the, the Nina vocalist, singer, composer, collaborator you are today. What a lovely question. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can sum up. Well, I've, I've, been, I've had the impulse to sing since I was really very, very small. And um, we grew up in a house without television. We listened to a lot of music and my parents are, love classical music and they played just so many beautiful albums. And so I, I sort of naturally um, channeled that impulse for singing and using my voice into classical, classical tradition. And, and um, was, you know, singing little opera songs as a kid and took lessons. And uh, when it was time to go to college, I, I, it was very clear to me that I wanted to dedicate my life to using my voice in a meaningful way. And um, I went into, yeah, I, I went to Northwestern and got my degree there in voice and opera. And um, when I graduated, I, it, it became rather clear to me in those last few years of school that likely opera wasn't going to be the route that I would take, or at least not traditional opera, like classical, classical traditional mm. opera. And um, that I, I was really thirsty for um, a vehicle of expression that allowed me a lot of creative freedom, and more creative freedom than I was used to having in, you know, traditional classical music. Mm. And I was very lucky I crossed paths with a very wonderful, brilliant Costa Rican composer who was getting his doctorate there at Northwestern named Pablo Chin. And um, he, he lives in New York now as well with, with um, his partner, Bethany Young, who's also a composer. And um, the, he, he and I started an ensemble called Phonema Consort. This was back in 2011, early 2012. And... Um, yeah, we, we just dove into the world of ensemble building and I was very lucky to work with many fabulous composers who leave plenty of creative space in their, their scores for performers, which is just so important because you know when you have that generative impulse, you go mad if you don't get to exercise it. So, yeah, um, I want to I hear more about yeah. that. But so you, but when, when you were young, like, so was it, was it a, was it your, your, your parents or your household that made you excited about it? I can imagine, I, you know, I can definitely Im imagine the, the space of no TV. I can't say our house is 100% that, but we're very yeah. um, low on TV. And actually this, this yeah. like kind of uh, remote school Zoom learning for little kids is just like, oh, wow, they're not used to staring at a screen at all during the day. Oh, poor they're things. Like, ah, you know, oh, um, their little but, eyes. Yeah, it's like, you know, for hours. Right? Um, yeah. But then, I mean, there's definitely videos around, but we, we, you know, there's definitely music to be played in our, in our house. And so were you, yeah. I can imagine what that is, but so you were singing songs that you were hearing on the record player or you were, is that how you got into classical music? Was it, it was that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There was especially one album that was the glorious Kathleen Battle um, and Itzhak Perlman, the great violinist, uh, playing together Bach works from some of his cantatas as the pieces that involved violin obligato and I, if you if anyone listening to this if you listen to this album you will literally deliquesce into a puddle of ecstasy it is so beautiful that was an Every... amazing sentence nina that was such a great sentence oh. <laughs> well that's how that's honestly how i feel when uh, i listen to that album yeah so it's absolutely beautiful. And I, I think when I look back and I'm like, what, what was the album that made me just go mad? And it was that, it really was to hear their, their two voices really, because mm. it sucks, violin sings, what can you say? When to yeah. hear them crossing like birds in that beautiful intricate lace work of box writing, you just, it's hard to survive. So. I'm going to, I'm going to go listen to it. I, I have to, I, I tell, I, I feel like, you know, I'm somebody that's learning about classical music. I'm, I'm working my way backwards. It feels like maybe oh, you're, cool. you're working your way more forwards or you worked your way. Now you're for, you know, I, I'm going like this. Um, yes. I need to check out. I'm going to write that down. I, I need to go. Um, the puddle of, I need to do yeah. that. <laughs> to do that into a yes, puddle exactly. of ecstasy. I need to yeah. a quest. <laughs> um, well, it, it is so stunning. And it is interesting what you're saying about like, 
you know, how you make your way to where you are from where you started out. And right now, I mean, this is probably getting ahead of things, but I will say right now, I feel that more than anything, I'm in the process of digging down mm. into more the earthiness of my practice and my interests. But yeah, I, that's interesting that you kind of, you came more from the like experimental kind yeah. of world. You know, drum set playing, you know, yeah. rock and pop music that then, you know, kind of overlaps into some more experimental things in that way. But I, I love the way you did this and then now you're going down. I really, I love that. Let's, I want to get to that. And so, but, but then, so in, in college, the moment of like digging into opera and classical music, there was a passion there, but then it was like, let me look for a music that has more space for. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it's, that... it, it's interesting the process of, of getting to the heart of, impulse or the why you want to do things as I feel like yeah as, as a child you know I felt this impulse many artists feel this impulse of like oh there's this there is this fire in me that needs to be expressed through generation and creation and oh wow I happen to have a, a voice that wants to move and that wants to make sound so okay that's where that will go and you find some channel you know for me it was classical um, classical music and then it's like you follow the thread of that fire as far as you can and if you hit a wall then oh, you have to like you know make a detour and yeah. find find the next find the next little burrow for yourself the next tunnel um yeah and and I just found that for myself with my own impulses I sort of hit that wall with classical music where I was like oh this I'm not quite able to get it out the way that I would like to mm. like it's not all getting out there's more here that it's not the right thing it's just not the right thing yeah well um, and then get, getting getting us closer to Brooklyn Bound but not 100% percent to Brooklyn Bound <laughs> exactly. yet you you this, I'm, I'm, exactly. I'm psyched to hear about the the ensemble you you built but at that time where you you were commissioning composers or playing newer repertoire and yeah. getting pieces written for you and were you exactly. writing music at all yet or you were people were writing music for you yeah people were writing music for me it's it's been a long road to writing my own music um i've been creating things in different ways i've always written text and poetry and things like that and um, I love setting up scenarios and the creativity of creating performances and things like that. Yeah, but it's taken me, I, I think I wrote my first piece in 2018. So I know. Mm. And now I'm, now I wonder how I lived without having my own practice. Like I, I, I'm a little mystified that it took me so long, but you know, that's how our paths work. Mm. you you get there when you get there with I yourself <laughs> similarly I mean I know I think I'm I'm just older than you so 2000 it wasn't 2018 for me it was you know 2006 or whatever you know but like uh you know after I had been doing other things creatively and professionally and I, I feel like the way you were talking about the ensemble you started with um Pablo Chin yes and yes. um and, and the way, the feeling I'm getting from the, the, the conversations you're talking about, you know, having pieces written for you. Like, I know when another composer writes me a piece, I still talk about it as ours. You know, I, oh. you know it's not, it's yeah. right. It's not like, you know, oh, yeah. they did this thing and I'm, you know, feels still. So, you know, maybe this like kind of creativity and the generativeness that you're speaking of was kind of there already in the commissioning. And then the composing is just another step of that or a different <laughs> version of that or something. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's like the, 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 it's, it's like, you know, learning to walk and, and things like that. Like you, you take steps toward the things that, that you just take steps towards your maturity mm -hmm. and the maturity of your expression and being able to um, feel that just, just the generative kernel coming from you is worthy of being expressed and being heard and, and has its weight, has its importance in the world. So I wonder many times if it's really just a mental process more than anything of, of being able to accept that. Mm. I love, I mean, I feel like um, just b before, before I zoomed you, I've, I've been reading this um, 
um, Julie Seisman book just because so is is you know been slow but finally like you know getting excited to learn a bunch of Julius Eastman music and and I feel like sometimes the his, historical narratives of music making can be so like oh this person did this you yes. know this person was a composer yes. this person was a performer this yes. person was you know and it's kind of amazing to read um, this narrative or these different these different kind of essays because it's like you know Julius Eastman as singer. Julius Eastman as pianist, yeah. Julius Eastman as composer, Julius Eastman as improviser, Julius Eastman as, you know, singing, you know, eight mad songs for, or eight songs for a mad king, and then also being in Meredith Monk's ensemble, and then also singing these solo yes. pieces that feel much more opera, like, you know, just how messy it all is. Um, yes. And it can be so um, easy for us, I think, to want to kind of, you know, box. It's like, oh, this is a neater way to talk about it, you know? Um, yeah, it's I totally such a agree. shame. And, yeah, right? <laughs> and I feel like you're, you're in this great place of, you know, um, yeah, having no problem with this, you know? Um, and so I think yeah. this question maybe doesn't make any sense, but, um, the question I'm about to ask. The, so on, on Brooklyn Bound, you're doing your own work. Yes. This, this hasn't been a, um, for you, writing music now has been, you're adding to your practice. It hasn't been a like, and now I'm not doing this anymore, I'm doing this. Right, exactly. You know, it's interesting. I, right now, I, I'm, in different ways in my life, I'm choosing to embrace amateurism. Not and I'm not talking yeah. about music here, but I think that amateurism is so important for really anybody, but for us creatives um, as ways of seeing where else we can be in the world, what else we can, what other parts of the world and, and living we can show up for and gather in and give back out. So um, yeah, the, the composing I think for me is, maybe I'll talk a bit more about that later, but I've been, I'm embracing amateurism in, in drawing. I've been drawing a lot these days and drawing the plants and animals here. And some of them are just awful. And fungus, no, you're, not, you're not drawing fungus or uh, you left um, out fungus. I have not, oh shoot, I didn't mention. <laughs> I'm sorry, fungus, beautiful balance keepers yeah. of the forest and our world. Forgive me. <laughs> and I actually, I have not drawn fungus yet, but I did have a wonderful dream about fungus. So I'm like, I'll get there to the drawing. But yeah, I've, I've been drawing with pen and okay. watercolor and- um, This afternoon. This, a this afternoon, yes. Um, so uh, what else? Oh yeah, my sister and I are also engaging in amateur naturalism, which, I think is maybe one of the most important practices that any human being can have right now, considering our cultural, spiritual disconnection from the world. So we are working on that. And I find these other, I'm doing some other things too, but I'm finding that these bring so much more richness to sort of my central artistic practice of using my voice. Um, as medicine for myself and hopefully for other people. But yeah, definitely I'm not like I am a composer and that's it, you know, or like I am a singer or that's it. That seems like such a tragic way to live life. My sister, my older sister, who is a trained actress, she brought to my attention a beautiful quote from um, Leonard Cohen which, oh, I don't want to get this wrong. Yeah, so right. let me just, let me just, it's on a screenshot on my phone. And, oh no, is it? Well, he, basically, I'll paraphrase. It, nice. can, it can hold up. Fair. So he, he was saying um, that poetry, he's talking about poetry. Poetry is essentially uh, what's sort of like what's given off in the wake of life. He's saying it's the ash of life and that you know that, that your, your life is burning well when, when there's plenty of ash, when the work is coming to you and things like that. And I really do feel that more and more with creation okay. right now. It's like, you can't, you can't ask yourself to create. It, it's something that happens to you as a process of living and, 
And it's like, it's the byproduct of a juicy life, of a life of inquiry and fascination and emotion and connection with many things. I think that's world. so cool. I, I feel, um, you know, I see, um, I see both of my kids making their way in through their own passions and, and different artistic outlets. And so early, it's kind of like the world is teaching them. I, I can hear one of my daughters say like, oh, I'm not the artist, I'm a musician because her sister draws better than her or whatever. And it's like, no, oh, no. no. You're, it's like, and, and, you know, uh, like you're yes. this and this and this yes. and this. And, and I think we're always too young to be like, to, to close the door, you know, like, yes. and the idea yeah. that at like seven and nine, you know, at nine years old, you know, somebody would say, or my daughter would say like, oh no, I'm not the artist in the family, I'm this. You know, it's like, it's so sad. And, you know, I, and I feel like, um, I don't think that's something that they're getting directly from me. And, and no. that it feels no. like, you know, I mean, though we need to look at ourselves so all the time, but it feels like it's like culturally that there's, there's a thing there about saying like, oh, I'm not this, I am this, I'm not this, I'm not this. Um, yeah. But can you get us, what a get shame. us, so I'm excited to hear about set. What is your, um, new piece that you're going to be doing in October? Yeah, so I'll, it's, um, it's called Red Moon Low, Bright Stars of Water. And it is directly connected to my experience here with the wildfire and to leaving our home. And the, the title, Red Moon Low, Bright Stars of Water, comes from a very, very short text that I um, composed in my mind as we were driving, we, we drove <clears throat> from here to Seattle because the air quality was better. The air quality was still abysmal in Seattle, three hours, you know, north of here. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was very, it was, a, I was, what's the word? We were in a state of just sorrow and terror it was very it it was one of the more like existentially charged moments of my life mm -hmm. along with many other you know the sure. loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg same feeling yeah. same feeling the the news of the denial of justice to Breonna Taylor same feeling mm -hmm. but yeah this was very palpable and it had to do with you know home and home wilderness and and you know larger feelings of fear about the planet and its health and we were in the car driving and it was a we saw the moon I don't know how through all that smoke but it was rising and it was very very low and it was a last quarter moon and it was bright red bright red it could have been the sun at night I've never seen anything like that in my life and I was it just it just it both was a wound and a gift to see it up there in the sky. And it just brought some words to me. Um, so the piece is, it begins with that text, which also the text uh, uses the image of a wonderful snake that is endemic to our region. It's a subspecies of the garter snake. It's called the red spotted garter snake, Thomnopis sirtalis conocidus. And it has beautiful, a beautiful flaming red orange head, very similar to the color of that moon. And it has gorgeous like paint stripes of that red orange all down its sides. And it's, it's a very, its sides are this gorgeous shiny black and it has this lovely pale yellow stripe down its back. It's a beautiful snake. So that local snake who lives here in the kind of Willamette Valley area is also a part of this Piece. I've always sort of associated snakes with water. I've had a mm. few dreams of snakes in water, like dreams that have been really important to me and that have stayed with me over many years. So yeah, for some reason, my mind does make that association and mm. with snakes. And the red spotted garter snake does love the water. When I first saw it, it was slithering down a bank over tree roots and over rocks down to the water and swam away in the water. So um, but yeah, so the, the piece is, is directly linked to my experience with the fires and um, just to some of the more, it's one way in which I'm spiritually processing 
what's happening here because of course the fire still isn't out you know yeah. you know how that works being a west coaster mm -hmm. they burn for a long time the fire stays in deep under the under the top layer of soil in the pine needles and dry materials down there and it burns in stumps and logs and snags for a long time so mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's an ongoing situation. So I, I find myself needing to continue to process this. And also as a way of thinking uh, sort of more directly confronting what's happening with the planet, I wanna make sure that I don't pass over this moment as a moment to deepen my understanding and, and deepen my connection with place and resolve to try to be more of a steward than a destroyer you know <laughs> well i i the, we've we've wonderfully wandered through a, and it usually happens because i get to talk to interesting people uh one kind of wandered through our first three three questions but you've kind of led us just so naturally to the fourth question i usually ask so it, it feels i mean it's it's awesome to hear um awesome impressive or something to hear you talk about your reaction to the the natural destruction happening right now around you talking about it in the same way as i hear a lot of um my friends and loved ones talking about you know wanting to use this moment of the black lives matter movement yes. or wanting to use yes. this moment of uh, yes. uh just what what does corn to like dealing with COVID and, and those yeah. like, you know, as moments of learning, um, usually I, I ask people about, you know, artists about what it means for themselves to be making music during this time of COVID and now this time coming out of Black Lives Matter and, and anti-racist kind of ideas. But, and for yes. you, it feels like, you know, you've so wonderfully brought in this other third huge mind boggling event that has made you think in larger ways like what 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 is being an artist for you mean right now in the craziest of crazy moments you know? oh my god that's such a wonderful question i've been talking about that a lot here mm -hmm. um and thinking about it a lot just because you know i i'm feeling that right now for those of us who love the earth for those of us who love each other and who who believe in creating a just society in which people are free to not be killed <laughs> in in which um you know in which yeah we we are practicing true equality um for people of color for black people for women for immigrants um you know this is a time in which we are going to have to become, I think, masters of holding just terror and, and horror and sadness in one hand and holding our joy and inspiration and wonder in the other hand. And I realize that in many ways, it's much easier for me, a white woman um, who has a support system to say something like that. But um, my thought process right now is is just you know we're we are simply going to have to become masters. When I when I heard of the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which actually it's the same I, I it was the same day as Rain Day that I was talking about that I marked down on my calendar the days that the day that the rains came here, and mm -hmm. we were outside we were walking in the rain and and just full of this giddy joy that we really haven't felt in a long time because it's been such a it's been such a an intense summer and the fires were so horrifying as i mentioned but anyway so yeah we were just filled with this giddy elation and and we walked inside and and uh you know my mom saw the news and mm. and told us and it was just this like the terror just washed over me again and in that moment, you know, and a similar thing also hearing this hideous news about the lack of justice for Breonna Taylor yesterday, again, like you just feel that veil of terror and sadness come over you. Um, yeah, and, and so I've just been thinking, you know, 
right now we have we're gonna have to if we want to stay alive spiritually we're just gonna have to become very good at holding these two things there's a very beautiful quote that's been giving me a lot of solace over the past two weeks from the incredible bryologist robin wall kimmerer um she she is a um she studies mosses she is indigenous her family has roots here for all the way back and um she has a, a beautiful quote let me see if i sum it up she says um it is not enough to mourn our lost landscapes we have to put our hands in the earth and become whole and i thought that was so beautiful you know that they're they're at this she's acknowledging you have to be mourning what what is being lost what we do not have like the loss of our landscape the loss of vision for our country potentially the loss of our democracy like we are facing all of those things we are feeling the mourning and the sorrow and the pain but she's saying it's not enough we have to be whole we have to put our hands in the dirt she's a very wise woman and and um mm. i i trust those words they are guiding me right now and i believe that our creation our work our art is part of that process it is for me you know right now my work is basically entirely at this point about my connection to the earth i i think it's a, just the most desperately important and the most generative generous relationship to be in to be in relationship with the world and so right now for me i'm almost seeing music and creation as a way of just interacting a little deeper with my environment you know so i see my beautiful red spotted garter snake and it means everything to me it's from here this is this is a snake that that orients me in the world you know like it tells me where i am and, um and so when i when i write a little piece for the red spotted garter snake it feels like a way of just interacting with this creature a little more and getting to know it a little better in the process and and maybe just extending a hand and trying to communicate with this creature in some way i mean we really don't have that many opportunities to communicate with the world like you know you're a, you garden you told me like you have your hands in the ground that's so beautiful it's a language it's a way of communicating with with this earth that gives everything you know um so i i actually i really do think that right now creation making music is such an important part of my you know quotidian existence my everyday life it's it's a it's another way of deepening relationship and and hopefully offering something out i know i'm getting so much from where i am it's such a generous place and um mm. Yeah. Well, I love, I mean, um, I, I think I'm, um, and this is, this is maybe not the right thing to do, or maybe it's a natural instinct. Like, I think I'm trying, I'm yearning for like, what's the positive that I'm going to take out of this moment that feels just like such a low. And, yeah. and I think some kind of re, um, reprogramming of, um, you know, I, I think in our, in our scene, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't know you well enough to assume that this, that you've experienced this at all. Um, because it, seems to me you could definitely be somebody who's floated above this um but for me you know you can it's easy to get to feel like you're in this rat race right of like you know oh, um, oh right yeah. like you, you know you want to oh. get this next thing or get this thing yeah. or get this show or get yeah. this call or whatever yeah. um and to kind of re um <laughs> when concerts aren't happening <laughs> to, to feel like actually the importance is so much more basic and doesn't have to do with numbers um no, no but it has no. to do with like um uh, you know, something more, more genuine and fundamental. Um, I, you know, I, I love, you know, trying to, trying to use this moment as a, a reframe for that. And, and the, the, um, I mean, I can't wait to hear your piece about the, the red spotted snake, but, but the idea that, um, that it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful act on multiple levels. And if nobody ever heard that piece, um, it's still a wonderful act, you know, like, yes. the, the, yeah. the, you know, yeah. um, I don't know. I'm start, I'm starting to 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 get there. Um, step, you know, in small steps in terms of just reframing the importance of our creative lives. You know. Yeah, 
Yeah. But I, I, I could listen to you talk about it for so long, Nina. I, I think you, 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 um, you are steps ahead of, of me, I'll say, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the relationship and the framing that you've been doing. I, I usually end these, these podcasts, and I'm, I'm actually excited about this question for you, just thinking in, in this moment where, you know, we've, we've, we haven't played music in a room with people for a long time. Um, and I'm very excited. You know, these Brooklyn Bound um, concerts have been just a time to all get together and experience something together, which is very meaningful to me. Um, and I, I imagine, you know, you'll be watching in your way, you know, in the chat for anybody who wants to, you know, interact with you while the oh, concert's absolutely. happening. That's been kind of one of the nice things. Um, but what's a memory that you have of, um, you know, I, I think when, when so is toured around, I often say, you know, part of our bonding in a van together as we drive, you know, from Portland to Seattle, you know, is, is, is talking about the concert experiences and the funny things that happen on stage or the wonderful <laughs> things that happened or the terrible things that happen or the <laughs> malfunctions or whatever, you know, and sharing those stories. Um, yeah. You know, what's a, what's a memory that comes to mind for you that's either, you know, either a transcendent wonderful memory or just a little funny thing that happened you know but a concert memory that that um keeps you you know I don't know that that um that is a nice yeah. memory for you you know one the first thing that came to mind so I think I'll just say it is actually yeah. it's it's um it was a show back in November that uh, my my ensemble fun in my concert and I did at a very, very beautiful place in Washington, D.C., the Mexican Cultural Institute, which is an extension of their um, embassy there in D.C. Mm. And we were working with a composer who we've, we've worked with for many, many years, almost for as long as Ponema has been in existence. And he's a wonderful uh, Mexican composer named Julio Estrada. Mm. And he wrote an opera um, called Murmullos de Paramo, so Whispers of, of Paramo, which is based on the novel Pedro Paramo of Juan Rufo, which, you know, if you've read, you know the, the emotional weight and intensity and beauty of that book. Um, and it is, it is a very dark book. It's about death and the disenfranchisement of, of you know, the vulnerable in society and things like that. And uh, he, he has a beautiful excerpt from that opera called Mictlan, which is for vocalist, double bass, and percussion. But he calls the percussion noisemaker because they're using many wonderful things, corn, stalks, palm leaves, beautiful things. And um, we, we just had such a transcendent experience playing that piece. It's long and slow, and it's, it's difficult and... and um, and you know, when I've been, since I've been here and have been sort of reorienting my my mind about the the music that means something to me that I haven't written music written by other people that means a lot to me. Mm. Um, you know, the work of Julio Estrada comes to mind. I think it's so deep. I think it's about humanity, and I think it's about the dirt. I think it has all these necessary elements in it but it was just you know we were in this gorgeous space there was this it was built sometime in the the you know uh, gilded era and there's this music room with this massive organ the walls were gold and and the um you know the the people there were just fascinating and and wonderful individuals and we, ha of course, we also had a wonderful time. We, <laughs> we really love each other. So it was just such a beautiful trip. And, and at the end, the music had its weight in the world. And I really felt that. And mm -hmm. yeah, that was just, I love it. I, I wish it were a, a funnier story, but no, it's, I, yeah. I always, <laughs> no, I think I learned a lot about other, I learned a lot about myself asking that question. Cause I kind of, I kind of wish my first answer was always like, you know, something really beautiful, you know, and usually it's something really, you know, like remember that time where we broke this, you know, flower pot on stage or when we, this, you know, terrible. Um, but I, I so uh, love with what you just said. And it speaks to the moment to me in such a big way that you said, um, you described the music as long, slow, and difficult. 
Yeah. But you preceded it with like uh, how magical and amazing the music is. Those were descriptors of amazingness. Um, yes. And I feel like in society right now, like we want, like what are the opposites of long, slow, and you know, like we want like, uh, you know, short, fast, and easy, you know? It's like, yes. we, want, we want the exact opposite of that in our everyday transaction. Yeah. Give um, us effervescence, please. Totally. <laughs> you know, quick hit. Um, I, <laughs> quick I, I love, right? I love the idea that, that life doesn't need to be about that, but the music for sure and like concert experiences, um, I'm definitely longing for that again. Um, yeah. Because I know even for us, when we, when we are doing things like Brooklyn Bound, um, you know, we're not looking to give, you know, two minute, you know, hits to everybody. We're not looking for it to be too short, but you know, it, it, it's harder to take in things staring at a screen, you know, and I can't wait to, yeah. um, to hear your music in a, in a room together. Well, um, thank you. you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present something on this series. I, absolutely. I'm grateful. It's yeah, it, it will be lovely. And it, it, it feels very nourishing at this time of, you know, there, there aren't very many chances to share work well, at the moment so it's thank you absolutely and and anybody who's watching this I think knows a little bit about Brooklyn Bound and this season would know that um you know friends and collaborators who are doing their own sets may pop up on different things that so is doing along the way so um folks can see your work Nina October 8th. Do I have the date right? It's October 8th, it's right? Is, that is it year? the 6th or the 8th? Oh, goodness. I'm uh -oh. going to look it up because I messed it up the other day. <laughs> oh, no. And I thought I, it was yeah. Thursday. There's, there's like I something. I the win. 8th? Oh, I my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I am I a poltroon. So. Okay. <laughs> no, we, we did so poorly the other day. We didn't know the answer either. Um, I know. Well, it's in my I'm calendar, in so I know the day. Eastern time. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, um you'll pop up hopefully singing some other music along the way with this ride it's fun to collaborate with new friends um it's something that we're all missing so i'm very grateful that you're up for all of this nina and for taking the time to talk to us today so grateful um see you see you in october either on the 6th or the 8th whichever we decide to do <laughs> I'll, I'll make it the 8th and gratitude from me as well thanks for thanks for chatting with me today this was great. absolutely We'll see you soon. See ya. Bye. Bye.